Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Cool. Yep. Um, we're a little bit afternoon. Uh, we'll get, I think we'll uh, start making some announcements and get started with our Echo Clinic today. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, as you may be able to tell, we don't have our normal kind of echo room. Uh, we decided to kind of uh, practice social distancing, and so kind of all of our hub team members are logged on individually from their own uh, remote locations, but uh, we should still be able to uh, have the clinic because uh, here at Project Echo, we do specialize in IT technology, and so I think we should be okay with all that. Um, again, it's good to see everybody. I'm Mordechai Levy, a UNR med geriatrician. Uh, will be the facilitator uh, for today's clinic. Uh, I want to encourage everybody, if you have a camera, to turn it on so we can see your face and kind of have that interaction. Um, and uh, before, I guess the first thing to start would be with introductions. And so I will kind of help facilitate the introductions today just to kind of make things a little bit easier. Um, I think uh, we'll start with all the spoke participants and then kind of move uh, to, the, to the hub team members. Uh, and so I see uh, P. Polina at from uh, Health Insight. Could you introduce yourself for us, please? Hi. Um, can you hear me okay? Okay. Yep. Um, we're now Comagine Health. Yep. Uh, it's quality improvement. And I work on uh, uh, ATOP, which is a project to reduce avoidable hospitalizations in nursing homes. Many of uh, the people we work with have dementia. So that's an interest of ours. Cool. Great. Welcome. Thank you for being here today. Uh, uh, David Dalton, would you mind introducing yourself for us? Howdy, I'm David Dalton. I'm a family med and osteopathic medicine provider in Cali Andy, Nevada. Cool, welcome, thank you. Uh, and then I apologize if I mispronounce this name, is it Kamisha? Hold on, how do I get off of the phone? Am I off the mute? We can hear you, yes ma'am. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm Kamisha Kazi, HCI coordinator for the state of Nevada. Cool, awesome, welcome. Nice to have you. Uh, then we'll move on to introductions from our uh, hub team. Again, I'm Mordechai Levy, UNR Med uh, geriatrician. Uh, we'll move move next to Leslie Baker. Uh, you might need to press. Now we can hear you. You can hear me. Yes. Okay. Sorry, I'm having some technical challenges here. I'm Leslie Baker. I'm the geriatric pharmacist at the Sanford Center for Aging. Cool. Thank you. And then Patty Swagger. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, again, my name is Patty Swagger. I'm with the Sanford Center for Aging and the Director of Clinical Education. Cool. Thank you. And then uh, uh, Kelly McMillan. Uh, Kelly McMillan. I'm a social worker at the Sanford Center for Aging. <laughs> working on a geriatric clinic and also uh, coordinate a variety of social service programs throughout the community. And then we have our awesome project coordinators and Project Echo IT to introduce themselves as well. Uh, we'll start with Sneha. Hi, my name is Sneha Sharma. I'm the program coordinator for Project Echo Nevada. Thank you. And then uh, uh, Amy. Hey, hi guys. Oh. This is it. Alan Fisk, I'm out in Elko, Nevada, and well, yeah, you knew that. Anyway, um, technical support, if you need, need some technical assistance, please uh, don't hesitate to call and we'll see if we can help you remotely or in person. Oh, wait, Thank I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so if we need help, we'll figure it out. Um, Amy? Hi, I'm Amy Smith. I'm the ECHO program assistant. So if you guys need anything, also feel free to reach out to me as well as Alan and Sneha. Uh, cool. um, and then we had one other person log on. Uh, Tracy, I don't know if you have any audio today. Um, if not, feel free to kind of introduce yourself by typing into the chat for us. All right. So uh, I think we, we regularly scheduled uh, a topic on. Uh, sleep apnea and sleep today. However, uh, due to all of the COVID-19, our subject matter expert had to uh, ask for to reschedule the clinic. Uh, and so unfortunately, we won't have that available. We won't be talking about that today. A um, couple other extra announcements because of the change uh, and it kind of being really late, late last week that we figured this out. We were unable to acquire the, the Beltka credit for this session. Um, and so we apologize for that. Um, and then if there's any kind of other questions about the credits or certificates for this kind of patient engagement series, uh, just email us at Project Echo Nevada 
Um, we may be able to answer some of those questions now um, with Patty, uh, but Troy, uh, our program manager at Project Echo, will also be able to help. So if there's any questions about that, type them into the chat um, or just kind of feel free to talk and we can answer those questions. Uh, any other kind of announcements that anybody else had or uh, thoughts that people wanted to bring up? Okay. Um, I think with that being said, I also want to make another kind of general announcement about uh, Project ECHO. Uh, with the COVID-19 uh, kind of sweeping our country and kind of all of these questions, we do, I want to make sure everybody's aware of our antibiotic stewardship uh, ECHO clinic. Um, we ha are having one this week on Thursday at 12.15. Uh, same channel, same link, same website. Um, and so I encourage anybody that has more questions about COVID-19 or is looking to learn more, uh, I encourage them to log on to that, to that clinic. Um, for today, to kind of come up with a topic, I, I, I'm going to offer a little bit of information on um, COVID-19, but then move on to kind of neuropsychiatric symptoms of dementia and how to kind of manage those with non-pharmacologically um, is going to be the main topic for today. Uh, but before we move into the didactic, I also want to give everybody a, ch uh, a chance that has any patient cases or questions. Um, I think I didn't notice any extra cases get, I haven't looked in the last morning, uh, but as of yesterday, we hadn't had any cases uh, submitted via our, via our online form. Does anybody have any kind of geriatric related questions that uh, that we can help out with today? Okay, well, if anything pops up, feel free to um, type in the chat or just start to speak up. I'm not gonna be able to see most of you today, so I'm gonna count a lot on Amy and Sneha to interrupt me uh, to, to let me know if there's a question um, because I'll be having the PowerPoint up. Um, so let's see. I'm going to be sharing the PowerPoint here. Oh no. Okay. Well, I'm having a little bit trouble sharing this morning. Um, um, I can share it. Do you want me to yeah, share it? I guess You'll have to share it for me. Thank you, Sneha. No problem. Cool. So uh, these are just kind of the initial disclaimers. Um, again, we'll be recording today. So if you want to have any concerns, just let us know and we can make sure that you're not on any of our videos. Um, and so we can keep going. And so go just, I think, back one more slide. I'm giving you the remote control. Oh. Cool. Um, it's a little delayed. So again, no PHI, um, including occupation, if any kind of patient cases come up. Uh, this is kind of the, I always like share the aim statement for our clinic. Uh, our goal is to kind of coach into professional teams on the principle of person-centered care for older adults with chronic health conditions. Um, we get a lot of, uh, we get funding from the Sanford Center uh, and recently had a grant um, and so we're kind of looking to collect some demographic information from everybody. Uh, so if you guys have time, uh, I think this is in our kind of month, and it has been in our monthly newsletters pre or weekly newsletters previously and is also on our website, uh, but just filling out some demographic information so we can kind of have a better idea of who's participating in our clinic. We'd appreciate that. Um, but then kind of moving on for the topic for today, uh, we're gonna talk just a little bit about COVID-19 uh, just because this, the COVID-19 does uh, seem to be affecting the geriatric population uh, disproportionately to the rest of the population with respect to mortality. Uh, so I'm just going to kind of touch base on that, but then kind of move on to more of the neuropsychiatric symptoms of dementia, specifically focusing on non-pharmacological approach uh, to dealing with those symptoms. Um, so no conflicts of interest related to today's discussion. Uh, so COVID-19, uh, the objectives for today are going to go over COVID-19, what is it, and then how we can potentially protect elders uh, from not only COVID-19, but also some of the consequences of the of the practices that we have to put in place to kind of minimize the transmission or spread of this disease. Um, and then we're gonna move on to the, move, the neurocognitive symptoms of dementia and um, non-pharmacological mechanisms to help improve communication. Um, so uh, over the weekend, I kind of read, uh, I read a New York Times article. And so uh, there was kind of one sentence in there that I thought would be helpful to share with everybody. Um, There's no evidence yet that older people are significantly more likely to acquire the coronavirus than younger people. But medical experts say that people over 60 are infected. They're more likely to have severe life-threatening disease, even if their general health is good. 
Older people with underlying medical conditions are particularly high risk. Experts attribute some of the risk uh, to weakening the immune system with age. Um, so I don't know if anybody else kind of had a chance to read this New York Times article over the weekend. No? Yeah, so I, it was a pretty good article as far as kind of giving a good perspective on how coronavirus might uh, affect uh, elder care. Uh, and so I, I think I have it in the references and so you guys can uh, take a look at that if you're interested. Um, moving on, uh, COVID-19, let's see. Um, COVID-19 stands for Coronavirus Disease 2019. You guys also might see SARS-CoV-2. Uh, SARS is, stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome from the coronavirus to uh, often kind of referring to the people that have that really acute critical illness that requires people to be hospitalized. Um, for people that are exposed to coronavirus, it's about five point, uh, these are kind of the in, from initial cases from China, uh, don't necessarily have data that's pertinent to the US, um, but in China, when this kind of originally happened in Wuhan, it was about 5.1 days was the median time or the most common time before symptoms started to show up after they got exposed. Uh, and the longest time uh, to symptom onset was about 12 days, uh, which is partly why we think that 14 day quarantine, if you've been exposed is such a good number. Sorry, this is a little bit of a delay when I, as I try and change slides, so. Um, so COVID-19 is most likely uh, to be asymptomatic, um, which I think is kind of the most concerning part about this virus. Uh, you know, I, essentially all of us that um, feel good, feel okay, I think there's, it's, we're not clear yet on this, but it seems like it's really likely that we're probably still contagious uh, if we do get exposed. And so it's really careful that we always kind of, when we're around our elders, to always act like we're exposed. Um, and then usually the ones that are young don't have comorbidities and so they aren't really likely to die. It's really not gonna affect them. Uh, and so the real important thing is to kind of educate people that, you know, I know you're gonna be fine, but what we're really looking to is protect those that are most vulnerable. Um, and sometimes that conversation works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, so we'll just kind of have to see. Hmm. Neha, are you moving that too or no? No, I'm not. No. Okay. Um, the minor symptoms of COVID-19 are likely low-grade fever, cough, headaches, or throat fatigue, malaise. Um, and then the major symptoms would be a high fever and shortness of breath. Uh, and again, those, those uh, the elders that have comorbidities are at the highest risk of death. A lot of this stuff we know, but just in case we hadn't been exposed to it, I kind of wanted to make sure we shared this, um, shared this with the group. And again, we are going to be talking more about COVID-19 on Thursday at our antibiotic stewardship at Echo Clinic. So I encourage everybody to attend that if they want to learn more. Um, kind of this next part is kind of more of the geriatric focus is kind of how do we protect our elders? Okay, I'll just keep it off of the uh, PowerPoint because I think that'll be a little bit easier. Uh, we'll just walk, make sure we wash our hands for at least uh, 20 seconds. Uh, we wanna make sure we practice social distancing, which essentially is avoiding non-essential travel. Over the last few days, the federal government is giving us, I think, more st stricter guidance about how many people should be in groups, uh, you know, what, what they define to be non-essential work. Um, and then I think the more thing to note is that if you do have to contact with people trying to keep about six feet apart is what people are saying as far as a good social distance when you do need to interact. Uh, and then always checking in over the phone rather than in person with these elders is preferred, especially for those that have med multiple medical comorbidities. Uh, also think it's important to probably delay non-essential outpatient appointments uh, and then utilizing whatever telemedicine is available uh, for, for visits so that you can kind of interact virtually rather than in person uh, when that's possible. Um, and so the, the big thing that I think uh, in the geriatric community we're talking a lot about, um, but maybe not missed in, this, in the 
mainstream media is that even before kind of COVID-19 uh, came out uh, and we started recommending all of the social isolation, uh, we were having lots of problems with loneliness uh, and social isolation uh, within our country. Uh, you know, in America, we don't necessarily have that kind of familiar structure where kids take care, care of their parents as they get older. Often people go to nursing homes or continue to live independently in the nursing homes uh, or in their own homes. Uh, and so I think the social distancing really has the potential to make this a lot worse. Um, here you can kind of see uh, just this year, they kind of, the CDC came out with social isolation and loneliness in older adults, uh, discussing the opportunities <coughs> for our healthcare system in order to improve this. Uh, and so I just kind of want to make sure that people are aware that loneliness and social isolation was already occurring in our elders, and this is likely to make it worse. Um, Kelly, I don't know if you have anything else that you'd like to, to share on this? Yeah, I just would, um, would add that um, I think what sort of exacerbates this is that the fact that uh, people may experience some social isolation, but they may have a little bit of contact with some people here and there. And now that's just really diminished. And um, it may, there may be a really strong reaction for older adults. If they're already uh, a bit lonely or socially isolated, they may have a lot more fear and anxiety that they're gonna be neglected or forgotten in some sort of way. Uh, so I think um, if uh, in terms of your practice, whatever, um, or if you uh, know people in your neighborhood, et cetera, and making a call, uh, checking with folks, encouraging others to do the same, I think is really valuable. Um, and I know uh, at the Sanford Center, um, we provide services to approximately 300 plus older adults who tend to be socially isolated. So we're gonna ramp up some things, so we'll do some telephone contact, checking in with them, and also, um, uh, finding out if they have particular needs and working with community services to uh, get them groceries or help them to get their medications, et cetera. Uh, so I, I do think um, this um, this whole need to sort of create social distancing uh, uh, it sort of exacerbates that sense of loneliness and social, isol social isolation for people. So um, that's what I have. Cool. Thank you, Kelly. Appreciate that. Um, what other, does anybody have any specific questions about COVID-19 that we can kind of share with uh, the antibiotic stewardship ship team or the, something that we can potentially address today, especially as it affects elders? So I do have a question, Ms. Kelly. Um, if somebody in fact has <clears throat> had uh, COVID-19, recovers, um, can they still get it again? Um, it's a great question. Does any, I guess before I, I try and answer kind of my understanding. Does anybody uh, online have any thoughts on that? Um, so uh, I, I, I don't think we know the answer to that question yet. I think we hear some things going on about that. Um, it's not common I, as far as I know for respiratory viruses to be able to be reinfected within the same season. Uh, but there is kind of some some talk that you might be able to get reinfected, so that's a potential option. I just I think we just don't know yet. Okay, and I think in your slide you also talked about the fact that somebody may be recovering and may not have symptoms, but yet they still um, could um, uh, cause another person to become ill. Is that correct? Exactly. Exactly. That's a great point. Yeah. So people that are. Uh, especially younger people, or any, even if you're older, if you're asymptomatic, uh, you could potentially still be infected with the virus, having it replicate in your nasopharynx, the back of your nose and your mouth, uh, and just breathing on people or coughing or sneezing, especially with allergy season, you can kind of expose that virus uh, to, the, to the people around you, uh, and you can infect people. Um, and that disease and that person uh, that you infect can be much worse than the disease you're experiencing. Um, and I, I'm pretty, it seems convincing at this point that that's likely going on uh, to a, to a more significant degree than it is with other viruses. Um, and so it's really important that, uh, you know, y'all, I kind of am pretending like I'm infected all the time. Uh, and so kind of do my, you know, I'm a doctor and so I still have to see patients and I'm not actually sick. Uh, and we don't yet have the testing available to kind of make sure we can screen all of our healthcare providers yet. Um, but kind of doing your best to kind of practice that social distancing, uh, minimizing those interactions uh, so that I don't, you know, I would hate to kind of infect the, the geriatric population that, I, that I'm here to care for, uh, especially those that are the most vulnerable. Um, and so uh, I'm kind of, I'll, I personally uh, am practicing like I'm always infected, uh, even though I feel okay. 
Any other questions before we kind of move on to the neuropsychiatric symptoms of dementia? All right. Um, so moving on to kind of the neuropsychiatric symptoms of dementia or otherwise dementia with behavior disturbances. Um, some of you may recognize that from your ICD, ICD-9, ICD-10 coding. Um, what I really kind of think about this lecture as is a kind of a guide to communicate with those who aren't able to. Um, as you develop dementia, uh, your ability to not only respond to your body, but respond to your environment changes. Uh, and often when people have behaviors um, uh, or certain or differences in their affect and their mood, uh, often that's a result of internal or external environments. Uh, and so trying to figure out uh, what that might be is kind of what, what I'm hopefully gonna be sharing with you all today. Um, before kind of talking about exactly how to address those uh, neuropsychiatric symptoms, I think it's always important to actually define what those uh, symptoms are. Uh, here you see a long list, ag aggression, agitation, depression, anxiety, delusions, hallucinations, apathy, disinhibition, wandering. Uh, this is just a partial list. Uh, depending on kind of what evidence-based source you go to, you'll find different lists with different uh, types of symptoms. But this is a, a common list of symptoms of things we commonly see. Um, I think the most important thing to do when you're kind of thinking about somebody with dementia that's having a behavioral issue is kind of seeing, putting it in the right bucket. Like what are we, what behavior are we actually dealing with? Um, you know, is this person actually being ag aggressive? Are they actually coming towards me, trying to be violent towards me? Or is it more of an agitation where um, I'm coming up to them and I'm trying to provide them sort of, sort of care and they get agitated and kind of get away? Um, you can tell when people have a little bit more depression or anxiety as well. You know, is there certain situations or certain people, certain tones of voices, certain rooms that cause people to kind of get anxious? Uh, delusions are false, false fixed beliefs. Um, hallucinations are... Uh, visual or auditory, uh, sometimes tactile or olfactory, uh, but much, much uh, usually visual or auditory uh, perceptions of reality that aren't really there. Apathy, uh, easy to, sometimes difficult to differentiate between depression, uh, but essentially just not really, not really caring about what's going on. Uh, disinhibition, that's something I commonly see uh, where people aren't really able to control their, their initial thoughts or their initial actions. Uh, and so people kind of can have, be verbally aggressive, um, or they can kind of get up without, without, without wondering, uh, without kind of any notice. Um, and if people have uh, physical debility, that can be quite dangerous. Uh, and then also wandering where people can just try and leave and they won't remember where they are, they can get lost, they can get hurt by the environment. Um, and so these are all different examples of neuropsychiatric symptoms of dementia. Um, would anybody want to add something to this list that, that is missing that they think is important to share with the group? Um, maybe vocalizing. I, I don't know if that, maybe that comes under anxiety because they do it because they're anxious sometimes. I think that's fair, yeah. Um, vocalizing, I think that's a good one. Thank you. What else? Okay. Um, that was a good one to add. Thank you. Um, so kind of moving on. Um, Um, you know, this is a really common thing that happens to people with dementia. Uh, dementia is a syndrome, you know, has multiple different causes like Alzheimer's or vascular or Parkinson's or Lewy body or a bunch of other ones. Uh, but if you take all of the people with this dementia syndrome, 98% of them will at some point in their disease will have a neuropsychiatric symptom. Uh, and so it's really, really important uh, that we know how to deal with this in kind of the, in the least harmful way in a way that is most impactful to, to our patients and to, and to the people that we're taking care of. Um, there's four main reasons that people have these neuropsychiatric symptoms. Uh, often it's a result of an unmet need, an environmental overload, such as sounds or people, uh, interactions of the individual caregiver. Um, people, rare, people do not seem to lose their ability to read, to read your affect, read your tone. Uh, read your body language, even if they have dementia. And so all of these nonverbal communication skills people are aware of, and that can really affect the way they interact with you as well. Um, and there's also environmental factors, um, whether it have to do with specifically with their medical illnesses, such as if they have problems eating, uh, or if they're acutely ill and need IVs, um, or if they've recently broken a leg and need some sort of uh, orthopedic care. Um, or have limited mobility due to that. Usually that's kind of the neuropsychiatric symptom is usually due to one of these four factors. Um, and it kind of often, uh, most of us are aware of these things, but often we don't necessarily have a, 
a systematic approach on how to kind of affect these things. Uh, and so a few years ago, um, they kind of have it in, an evidence informed, but not necessarily an evidence based model to kind of help improve our ability to kind of go systematically through uh, addressing these neuropsychiatric symptoms of dementia. And, and they kind of call that the DICE model. Um, I gave this lecture, I think, I don't know if it was six months ago or a year ago um, to, or uh, to everybody. And so this might be a repeat for those of you that were there. Um, but I really like the DICE model where you describe, investigate, create, and evaluate um, a way to kind of deal with this neuropsychiatric symptom. And so I'm going to go through the DICE model, um, the DIC and E. Uh, again, this is an evidence-informed, not an evidence-based medicine. Um, and uh, the article, again, it's referenced at the kind of end uh, is I think does a much better job of explaining the DICE model than I'm able to uh, today. And so I encourage you all to kind of read that as well, um, but we'll kind of go through it now. Um, so the first D is describe. Um, and so somebody's coming up to you uh, saying they have um, essentially uh, having a neuropsychiatric symptom. The most important thing to do is have the caregiver play back the symptom as if it was in a movie. You kind of want to have a step-by-step. -step. Uh, often people try and interpret uh, the behavior right away. Often people have their own perspective. Um, and so it's really important that you do your best to kind of get the most objective information that you can. Uh, and this is what we do in describe. Um, but not only should you kind of get the caregiver's perspective, the person taking care of the person with dementia, you really need to get the patient's perspective. Um, I can't tell you how often uh, the patients kind of remember these symptoms and kind of tell you exactly why they were angry in that situation. Uh, and, you know, and so that gets more and more difficult as the dementia syndrome progresses, uh, but especially in the early dementia syndrome and even in moderate to severe, sometimes people can remember these things uh, and they can tell you exactly what they were thinking and how they were feeling during those times, uh, especially because they're really emotionally charged. And as we all know, the more emotionally charged something is, the more likely we are to remember it. Uh, and so it's really important to listen to the patient's uh, perspective on these. Um, and then again, uh, we, when you're describing that, you kind of want to ask them what the most distressing part of the behavior is. Um, you know, often we will assume, you know, that people don't want to be hit or people don't want to be talked to a certain way. Uh, but you'd be surprised how often that doesn't bother the patient or the caregiver, uh, how often some of these behaviors kind of uh, essentially were going on before the dementia even happened. Uh, and those aren't really the most distressing things to them. And so it's really important that you find out, you know, was it the, is it the fact that they're just not bathing that's uh, most important, or is it the fact that they're hitting you while they're trying not to bathe that's most, that, you're trying to, that you're trying to address? And so making sure that you're clear as far as what behavior uh, you're dealing with is really important. Any questions about describe uh, before I move on? All right. And again, just type into the chat if you have any questions or just feel free to interrupt me. Um, so investigate um, is what we do after we kind of have got a good idea of what the, the situation is, when it happened, uh, get both the caregiver and the patient's perspective, and then identifying the most distressing part to both the caregiver and the patient. Um, once you have it described, you kind of want to investigate why did this happen? Um, and so there's multiple considerations to kind of take in. Uh, you have to take in both individual or patient considerations and the caregiver considerations. Uh, this is very similar to the workup for delirium uh, from my perspective. You really need to make sure there's not an acute medical issue going on. Maybe they have really bad COPD and they're in exacerbation and they can't breathe or they're in heart failure and when they try and lie down to go to bed, they can't breathe. Uh, and that's why they're wandering and getting up out of bed all the time. Uh, and so those are really important things to keep in mind. Again, people can be bored. Um, as well, and that could just be the simple reason. And so just giving them an activity to do uh, could be a, a great way to, to help improve, um, improve the behavior. Uh, from a caregiver consideration, uh, you really need to consider their health literacy. Uh, some people have preconceived notions and ideas of what is good and what is bad. Uh, and so uh, understanding why they acted a certain way or what they're hoping the interaction is, uh, is really important. Uh, and then kind of knowing the family culture or like the, the dirty laundry is what they say in the, um, in the article. Uh, essentially, these are kind of things that we really need to acknowledge, uh, but we don't really want to address or fix because that's kind of really out of our scope. Uh, people have certain ways that they live their lives and interact with each other. Uh, and so understanding what that family culture is, is really important as you kind of investigate uh, why this neuropsychiatric symptom might be happening. Um, I'm a big checklist guy, and so here's a little checklist as far as when you're investigating this neuropsychiatric symptom of dementia, I always encourage people to just kind of pull this out, uh, make sure they did all of these things, um, you know, elicit the caregiver's perspective, elicit the patient's perspective, 
uh, review um, medical history, review the psychiatric history, assess for any sensory impairments. Maybe they just can't hear or see you when they're trying to talk to you. Uh, is there pain? Uh, maybe they have bad arthritis or bad back pain. Uh, and that's why when you try and do certain mobility things, they start to hit you or start to be more aggressive or agitated. Um, sometimes people can have a new medical condition. Uh, as we get older, uh, you can still develop gout, you can still get infections, and so making sure none of those things are going on. Um, and again, you want to assess for any worsening of any chronic or uh, chronic medical or psychiatric condition. Uh, sleep hygiene is also really important. Uh, sleep hygiene uh, involves a lot of uh, improving people's understanding of, of normal sleep as people get dementia. Uh, as people get moderate to severe dementia, your sleep-wake cycle changes um, invariably. And so sometimes people like to sleep for three hours and sometimes people like to be up for three hours. And so they end up sleeping four or five times a day. Um, but, uh, uh, and that's just kind of the way they are. But, and so you kind of have to meet the caregiver and the patient kind of where they are because in some environments that might be okay. There might be caregivers available to be available every three hours or so. But in other environments, you know, that, that might not work. You know, they might need people to kind of be awake for three hours. Um, this is my dog, if you guys can see him. Uh, and so medication reviews are also helpful. And then uh, again, modifying the way we approach the situation that results in the NPS. Again, a lot of it could just be due to our body language or the, our tone of our voice. And so making sure we're mindful of that or the caregiver is mindful of that to kind of minimize that behavior. Um, any questions about investigate before I move on? All right. Um, and again, just feel free to type into the chat. Uh, so then once you kind of described and investigated what might be the cause, you wanna create a plan. Uh, make sure you include the patient and the caregiver in the plan. Uh, the more minds, the better. Uh, if you have access to an disciplinary, in a disciplinary team, or you all have access to our geriatric echo clinic, we're always happy to kind of help create these plans with you once we kind of get this information. Um, and, and essentially the main thing is to kind of eliminate the aggravating environments, uh, such as bath times, certain rooms, sounds, uh, health education, uh, health literacy really kind of plays an important role here, making sure people understand what's really important to that patient um, and making people realize people don't need to bathe every day, um, depending on how active they are and kind of, uh, and what the, it's okay to bathe once a week, once a week, it's okay to base twice a week, uh, depending on what the issue is. Um, once you kind of create that, uh, you kind of want to uh, essentially create a plan based on the investigation. Uh, I also use a checklist for this one. Uh, again, the, the three main things are enhancing communication strategies, uh, changing the environment if you think that's causing it, and then having scheduled follow-up, which is the most important part. Uh, here are just kind of some simple things to kind of look at uh, for that checklist. Um, for things that you can consider changing. Um, so the, the last part is E, or schedule a close follow-up. Uh, that's the most important port, part of all of this, is you create a plan. Uh, some of the things you, you suggest or come up with with the patient and the caregiver will work, some things won't. It's really important that you guys figure out why did it work, why didn't it work, why did you not try it, why did you try it? Uh, these are all kind of questions that kind of will help so that you're on their team uh, and that you're kind of working towards improving uh, the communication between the patient and their caregiver um, and, and hopefully improving the patient's quality of life as well. Um, and then, uh, and I think the most important part to, to educate people on is especially once you get the neuropsychiatric symptom controlled is that you may have to kind of revisit this in the future as people's dementia syndrome progresses, uh, their, their behaviors will change and will likely need to kind of reevaluate as new symptoms come up. Um, and so just for a quick review, the DICE model, uh, we describe, investigate, create, and evaluate. We want to play by play. Uh, we want to know why they could be acting this way. You want to create a plan, making sure you use the patient and the caregiver, as well as the interdisciplinary team, if you have one. And then as you evaluate, you want to make sure why did these interventions work or why did they not work? Um, and so the, the kind of, at the end of the day, we know that, you know, 98% of people with dementia may get some sort of neuropsychiatric symptom of different kind of uh, intensities. Um, but why do we kind of care about managing these? Uh, it's because we know that if we can modify these behaviors, we can potentially mod modify the disease course and minimize complications. Um, we can uh, um, potentially improve the underuse of conservative measures. We know that medications really do not work and have evidence or no, poor or no evidence of efficacy. Um, and we're, again, we're really hoping to improve the quality of life for the patient and the caregiver. Um, 
we know that people with neuropsychiatric symptoms of dementia have earlier nursing home placement. They have excess morbidity, excess mortality, excess hospital stays, and increased caregiver stress, depression, and reduced caregiver employment income. Uh, and so these are all the reasons why we want to do our best to kind of manage these symptoms conservatively and not use medications if we can. Um, and so that is kind of the, the quick rundown on uh, neuropsychiatric symptoms of, of dementia, a uh, non-pharmacological approach uh, using the DICE model. Uh, the last time we gave the discussion, Kelly Presser, who was unable to make it here, also again, gave us the VA ABC model of, of, of treating these symptoms as well. Uh, and so what questions can we answer or can I answer about the neuropsychiatric symptoms of dementia? Um, I don't have a question, I have a comment. <clears throat> sure. You know, um, it was in your, the creation piece, and uh, including the family and, and those kinds of things. Um, in our clinic, we find that sometimes families don't understand this, the condition at all. And so uh, you know, getting the education and support from Alzheimer's Association and community resources is really, really important <clears throat> in a lot of ways. Um, and helping them understand it's an ongoing sort of piece. Uh, and the other thing that um, we see frequently in our clinic is that <clears throat> families believe they're not doing enough um, and helping them recognize that you know, what they're doing is helpful or, or if it's not, you know, giving them some recommendations about other helpful behaviors. Um, but families, I think, need a lot of support to know that, <clears throat> uh, that they're doing the right things um, and that uh, they may have to modify their expectations around behavior change. So um, I just think, um, uh, like I said, uh, your point about including family just becomes so important. And typically they're the, they're the ones who come in with the concerns uh, and helping them to recognize that <clears throat> um, uh, it's, it, uh, it, the situation can change consistently over time and to be prepared for that. Yeah, great point. Thank you, Kelly. Any other questions that you all have on a uh, neuropsychiatric sense of dementia? Um, have you all ever tried to use a DICE model or used a different model in your practice? Okay. Um, well, I guess I don't, I don't see any questions. Um, uh, I'll just kind of make an announcement for our next clinic. Uh, our next clinic is on April 21st from 12 to 1. Uh, I think we're, I don't know if the topic is yet figured out. Um, Patty? Yes, it's on driving assessment. Driving assessment. Thank you. Sorry, I forgot to fill that in. Um, and so hopefully that'll be helpful for everybody. I know that's a common issue that we deal with. Um, uh, in my clinic all the time. People always ask, when is it appropriate to drive? How do we, how do we keep people safe? Um, and so that'll be a good one. And then we have somebody coming from the community for that, Patty? Correct, we have an occupational therapist coming from the continuum. And she's gonna talk a, about what they do as a complete driving assessment, but also provide opportunities or options for those throughout the rural areas for things that they might be able to do within their own clinics to help decide is somebody safe to drive. Cool, thank you, Patty. Um, and then any other announcements, Neha or Amy, that I forgot to make? Cool, all right. Well, we'll, uh, we'll no, log on, we'll like, oh. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, there seems to be a question from Dr. Bayan. He says, appears DICE model similar to other assessments? Yes, definitely. What other assessments have you used, Dr. Bayan? Good old H and P, got it. <laughs> uh, history and physical. Um, yep, and so the good that the dice model is definitely very similar to a uh, history and physical, um, uh, which just get, can, can give a little bit more structure when specifically dealing with the neuropsychiatric symptoms of dementia. It's a good point. Thank you. 
but the plan that includes family members is a definite yes. So cool, glad we do that as well. Um, anything else? Um, got? Th this is Patty. Um, I think one of the difficulties is, is the communication barrier with some of the very demented patients. You're trying to find out, you wanna help them. It's very hard for them to express what's bothering them sometimes. And sometimes it's something like, uh, you know, they're describing something about, I mean, I removed a plant from someone's room because they were um, having some delusions about it. Um, but, but, and then some of the very upset patients, when they get really upset, it can be hard to find out what is bothering them and what you can do about it. Yes, that's a, that's a great point. Um, I find that uh, recognizing it as you kind of are um, is really the most important portion uh, and then kind of doing your best to kind of trial and error is often, you know, when you create that plan, uh, kind of coming back to it to see if, to see if it was effective or made things worse or had no effect. Um, and then again, just being aware of the recent things that have changed, right? Because often uh, it's the environment that's changed. You don't often see um, people have big switches as far as their symptoms. Usually it's a gradual change over time uh, that their caregivers can notice um, that, you know, they're just getting a little bit more agitated over the last week. Um, but if you have this big sudden change in people's behaviors, uh, you really need to think what acutely could be going on. Sometimes it's actually a delirium, uh, which is much more common in our demented uh, patients with dementia. And so making sure there's nothing reversible uh, as well. Um, but yeah, sometimes people, people love their plants, people love their animals, um, people love certain blankets. Uh, and so removing those from their environment can have serious effects on the way they interact with us. Good point, thank you. Cool. Um, well, thank you everybody for those questions um, and that discussion. It was kind of helpful for me to kind of learn your all's perspective and what you're all dealing with too. Very, very similar to things that we've, I think, all dealt with in the different parts of our careers. Um, and so we'll kind of leave it again open for any questions. Um, we'll log on, but uh, thank you guys for coming today and we'll, be, we'll see you again next week.